Hi, welcome back to the breadboard. Today we have another review. This time it is a micro programmable logic controller from a company called Bath Electronic in Germany. Iris Components of the UK sent me this for review. Um, and what we're going to do is have a little look at the main unit, look at what its features are, and see how easy it is to program. Fairly well in line with what we have done with previous programmable logic controllers over the uh, past few videos. So um, what is the unit we got? Well, it's as I said, it's a micro unit. This is what it comes in. So as you can see, pretty small. Um, I have the STA600, which is a starter kit, which consists of an STG600 microcontroller and some add-ons. So one is you get a little 9-volt battery for testing, a small manual to tell you how to get started, and in the box, we have two little smaller compartments, so we'll just pull those out. And in one, we have the microcontroller, so let's just pull this out. And this is the complete microcontroller, as you can see, really, really tiny. It's not one of these, you know, if you want something that's going to be controlling a whole bunch of massive machinery and things like that with comp complicated algorithms, then this is not the one for you. But if you want something that's going to be controlling um, some lights, some relays, ma making some heat, um, humidity, light sensor type of measurements and things like that, or controlling some small uh, piece of machinery, then this may be just up your alley. It's very straightforward to program. As you can see, it's very small. It works on anything from about 7 volts through to 32 volts DC, so that's pretty good. And the STG600 has 10 inputs and 9 outputs, and we'll go through what the uses of those inputs and outputs can be um, as we go through the video. For now though, this is the main unit. It's power supply. Let's just have a look at the quick specs on the sheet here. A analog in 0 to 30 volts DC inputs, two digital inputs up to 10 kilohertz in frequency, um, one PWM input up to two amps, sorry, one PWM output up to two amps, uh, programmable status LED, Input volts goes from 7 to 32 volts, so along in line with all of the other PLCs we've looked at so far, in industry typically you'd use a 24 volt supply to drive most of your control systems. Um, temperature range minus 40 to plus 60, so it covers most of the environments you want. Um, robust vibration resistance and things like that. The entire um, unit is actually potted. There is no there's going to be no tear down for this because you can't get into it. Basically, they've um, set the electronics up on the board, poured a whole bunch of resin in and sealed her up. So it's um, good for harsher environments where you would want to protect the electronics and things like that as well. Um, reliable solid state outputs, programmable status LED, USB connection to a PC. So this, even though it's a small programmable logic controller, um, it has a USB port. I'm not sure why it has this kind of connector versus a standard USB socket, which would make it much more universally friendly for cables. You know, nothing worse than showing up on a job site to find that you forgot the exact right cable to connect into here, but you've got a whole bunch of regular USB cables. A standard USB micro or mini connector would have been just fine for this, I think. Uh, anyway, that's what it's got, so it, it works fine, and you get a, an adapter for it anyway that comes with it. Um, what else is on here? We've got uh, intuitive graphical programming, and we'll have a look at some of the programming capabilities as we go through. Um, we'll try and set up a little circuit using maybe a temperature and light sensors or something like that. Uh, I've got a few different um, electronic sensors that RS Components has sent me to, to play with when I'm evaluating these units, so we'll pull some of them out and have a look. Very, very flat housing. It's only 10 millimeters thick. That doesn't include the um, connectors and things on the top. This is just the basic unit, it's 10 millimeters thick. And so we'll stick it on a current meter and see how much power it actually draws as well. So let's have a little bit of a closer look at, oh, got the other box of bits. So what we also have come with the unit, and just tip these out on the bench, is, as I said, we have a USB adapter. So it's got USB connector at one end, standard connection for the PC and the um, industrial kind of plug on the other end. These are using quick release connectors. So if you did need to uh, make up another lead, it would be pretty easy to do so. You then have 
um, connectors for your digital inputs and outputs. So they're again quick, quick connect one. So you just push the orange tab on the end here, push your wire in, let go, and it's got a very, very powerful uh, spring connection to keep a hold of that. So that's really easy and nice to um, use and hook up. And then you get a little two pin version for your power connection. And then as part of the starter kit too, which the starter kit really is the um, the battery, the USB cable, and the little battery adapter, I think. We'll have a look at the difference when we go through on the computer, when we're looking at the software, we'll do a quick check on RS Components website. And then they give you a little nine volt battery uh, clip so that you can connect the nine volt battery to the unit. I did a drawing up because when I was reading through the specifications that were saying, you know, one and a half amps for each output and things like that, it was getting a little bit confusing. So what I did was a little Visio diagram that will actually hopefully make this a little clearer. So let me just bring this into view on the computer. Well, on the camera, should I say, and we'll have a look. Okay, so without getting into too much technical details about this, um, this is just a picture of the STG600 right here. So you've got your um, plus and zero volts in, your status LED that you can actually um, manipulate under program control. You've got your USB input and you've got your um, inputs, digital inputs one through 10 and your digital outputs one through nine. Now, what I've done is above here, and I'll make this diagram available on the site too, is all of the inputs you can have as an analog input. In fact, they're only analog inputs, really. You cannot, or I haven't seen yet how to make them act directly as a digital input. You have to put a um, little comparator on the input from what I've seen in the programming. And we'll have another look at that when we go through it. But each of them has a um, analog input, which you can set the threshold to be a one or a zero and things or you can use it as a full analog to digital converter and it basically gives you a 0 to 10 volt range giving you um, your digital values. It's got a um, 10 bits plus or minus 3% is the accuracy of the ADC and it will go up to about 100 hertz in frequency. The input impedance is around about 11 kilo ohms to ground for the input so uh, knowing that uh, you know, you know, it tells you that you have to have basically either your 10 volts or your 24 volt supply going through your sensor and then onto the input of this. And then, of course, you've got your 11K to ground. Now, you could parallel that if you wanted to increase the amount of current that you're going through. Maybe you were going to do a um, 4 to 20 milliamp loop or something like that. So you could set it up to make better use of the range. Or if you're okay with the 11K ohm load, you can put a divider chain, maybe you had a temperature sensor you could put on the high end or a light sensor or something like that. So you've got say uh, a 10K um, LDR, photo, transit, photo resistor or something that you would hook on here and then you've got a nice little divider. The first two inputs here are a 30K to ground. They have a different input impedance than the rest of them. So three through nine have an 11K input to ground impedance. Input one and two though, have a 30K input to ground. And I think part of that is because they have different um, connections and circuitry inside of course. And what it can do is take a one kilohertz frequency, um, so much, much higher. The first ones, if you remember, were only a hundred hertz. This one is actually rated up to a kilohertz frequency um, input. And I think it may even be able to go higher than that. And we'll do some evaluation. We'll put a um, signal generator on it and see what it can really go up to. Anyway, so you've got the input split into two different things here. 30 kilo ohm input impedance with um, high frequency um, inputs. And we've got the rest of these analog inputs, which have an 11K to ground and up to 100 hertz frequency input. Um, these will do, all of them are basically your 10 bit accuracy for the A to D converter. On the outputs though, these are this is where it changes just a little bit from a lot of traditional ones. Um, because it's a micro PLC, there isn't any room for putting big relays or anything like that. So what it has is a series of, um, I'm assuming FETs. I actually haven't seen anywhere that actually specifies what it is, but it's most likely to be MOSFETs. But either way, they're driven, the outputs are driven high from the input pin for the battery. So, excuse me, if you remember on here, we've got our battery input, or you can have up to, you know, your 27 to 32 volts on your input. The plus rail here, which I've got signified over here, is actually connected through whatever the drivers are for the output, whether they're uh, PNP transistors or uh, P-channel MOSFETs, I'm not sure which, but either way, 
it's that supply input that is driving to these outputs, which is one through eight. And they're each one rated at one and a half amps, but you cannot exceed um, six amps total on that line. So if you've got four of them all running at one and a half amps, you can't use the other two. Um, you can also parallel some of these. So they're one and a half amps each, but if you actually need to be able to drive a load that will take three amps, you can connect two of them in parallel. And obviously the other side of the load would go down to a common ground to the other side of the controller. Um, the very last output here, which is uh, output nine, this is the two amp output. And what it does, it is actually a syncing output and it will actually take a load that's already connected from say 24 volts through the load and it will sync it to ground so it's a it's a low level sync output rather than a high level push output all right so you have to remember that now one of the other things about these that you that is written in the specifications is that all of these uh, push outputs are short circuit protected and things like that and that is coupled with the fuse of course that you put on the input to the controller um, the Syncing output though the PWM output on pin 9 is not protected So if you take 24 volts and you put it right in there and turn that thing on you're probably going to fry the controller So it is very very important to make sure that you put a fuse on the input to the supply of this controller so that you protect it um, And it says right on the actually in the instructions and I replicate it here requires a fuse at 8 amps mandatory for voltage reversal protection and also for the short circuits on here um, inside the controller, we've got a 64K flash for storing your programs. We've got 1K of EEPROM for storing uh, a minimal amount of logging data and things like that and other things that the controller would need for its operation. You have a watchdog timer to keep things going and make sure that stuff doesn't lock up or anything like that. We've got brownout detection and, of course, a USB programming interface. Um, and the other thing as well, going back to the inputs for a second, all of the inputs are... Um, tied to ground so you have to drive the inputs you're not taking a switch or a relay or something and connecting the input to ground it just wouldn't even recognize that what you need to do is you need to drive these high ie towards the supply now you can't drive the inputs I don't think more than what the supply is so if you're running this on 12 volts say with a car you can't drive 24 volts in on these inputs or if you've got a 9 volt battery you can't drive them in with higher than 9 volts if you're running on 24 volts of course you can drive them in with 24 or up to 32. Um, I would imagine that in most cases though you're either going to be running this off of a 12 volt battery in some kind of commercial install like a, a battery backup kind of system for lighting or something like that um, or you're going to be driving it off of 24 volts. For mounting the controller too, the, um, the little controller here, all you've got for mounting well, all you've got is you've got two screw holes here on either end where you can actually screw it to a panel or something like that. Or you've got um, four slots, one in each corner, which the, the instructions say you can actually just put a cable tie through there and wrap it to a, a conduit or something else just to secure it uh, um, up in an installation or something. So that's the installing for it. Um, that's really not much else I can say looking on the outside of the controller. What you really need to do now is go and have a look at some of the software. So um, that's what I think we'll do next. Uh, if you obviously have any questions on this, please let me know. And what I will do is I'll um, scan the specifications or point you to the specifications on the web so that you can actually have a look at more of the detail specs as well as we go. Now, I will be testing some of this um, very shortly on the video. So we'll also investigate some of those um, frequency control inputs and the uh, A to D conversion capabilities and things like that. So let's uh, get to the bench. Okay, put together a quick demo now in the hardware. And uh, what I'm showing you right now is the uh, display of the user interface uh, program designer, which is the MyCon, which you can download from the Bath website. I'll provide the links when I do the post. And what I have here is um, basically a couple of macros which are effectively like sub-designs. One is reading analog inputs and I have three analog um, voltages feeding into the micro PLC. And I also have a Hall effect magnetic sensor which is a limit stops um, industrial sensor which is feeding into another one. So what I've done is I've created these as um, sep two separate programs and put them in as macros and I'll show you that when we go through the design. The output from the whole sensor, this sub 
flow for the hall. Um, what I've got, if I can show you here. So the Hall Effect sensor comes in. I'm using a comparator uh, with hysteresis so that I can actually convert it into a Boolean value and set the thresholds of the voltages between a logic naught and a logic one. Because as I mentioned earlier, the digital inputs of all of these um, channels are actually analog and you just simply put a hysteresis in to convert it to a digital. Uh, then I'm inverting it because I've got a logic low coming in when the Hall effect sensor detects an object in its uh, range. So I'm inverting it and then I'm feeding it to the LED status on the front panel of the micro PLC. Um, I'm also feeding it out to output one of the PLC, which is one of the one and a half um, outputs, and that's um, going to be connecting to a 10 watt power LED. It draws um, about 350 milliamps ish at 12 volts. I then have the same output going to a 10 second delay and then that goes out to output 2 which drives another 10 watt LED and the idea here is that if you detect something with the sensor then the first light immediately comes on. After 10 seconds if the sensing is still there it'll bring the second light on. For instance, you know, somebody's hovering around in a hallway, you could bring one light on just to provide a little bit of um, lighting for safety reasons, but if it appears that people are going to be staying there for a little while, you can bring on more lights. Um, and then the third output is connected to a um, another 10 watt LED, but this one has some logic associated with it where I've got a um, percentage, uh, an analog value coming in between 0 and 100 and I'm using a comparator and I've set the threshold at 50 percent going through an AND gate and then out to output 3. Now what this will do is if the delay has occurred and that output is on and the light level because this hooks into the analog sensors from the um, effectively the luminosity output from the PWM and I've scaled it to 0 to 100 percent then when it's over 50%, which means it's reasonably dark and the lights have come on at a fairly reasonable level, um, and you've got motion detected, it'll bring on the third light to add even more lighting for you. Now obviously you can do whatever you like with the logic, um, but that just happens to be what I've done here. Um, the second one, if I just go in and show you the analogs, I've got the three analog inputs. I've got a thermistor, which is a 10K thermistor, and it just adjusts its value depending on the temperature. Um, I've got a potentiometer which I basically sat between 12 volts and 0 volts and I just sweep the wiper between the two. You've got to remember there is an 11K resistor to ground as well so that will effectively give it some kind of nonlinear um, range but of course normally if you had a full-blown uh, sensor out there you would probably have an amplifier on it and everything else and you wouldn't be doing it as a potential divider. And then the third input is a uh, Lux um, sensor. It is also a light dependent resistor, so it's still a resistor from the 12 volts to the input and then your 11K down to ground as well. Um, and in this case, I'm actually feeding it up to a uh, multiplier um, because it's going to be going between 0 and 12. I'm multiplying it by 12, and you can put any factor you like there. It doesn't quite get to 12, so that's why I gave it a value of 12 to effectively try and scale it up to a base, a sort of a 0 to 100 for a percentage of light. Now, I, the PLC does not support complex maths like sine, cosine, logarithms, or anything like that. Uh, it does have some function um, blocks, building blocks, but they're just your uh, modular plus minus multiply division, um, and that's really about it, and then, you know, your logic ones as well. So I can't do a scaling, a logarithmic scaling of the uh, lux resistor, the, the light sensor, to, you know, a kind of a lux reading. So I've just taken a threshold. And obviously, if you were using this in some kind of commercial, home, or uh, industrial environment, and you didn't really care what the light level was, you just simply wanted to say, well, if it's dark, turn the lights on. If it's not, turn them off. Um, and then, you, you know, you don't really care what it is. You can just basically wait till it's about the right light intensity that you're interested in, uh, measure the value, and then just set your threshold appropriately. So all I've done is I've set it to 50%. Um, I then convert it from a, a, 
a word to a float in value. I then have a subtract 100 from it, which effectively gives me a uh, 0 to 100% instead of 100 to 0 because the way the voltages is working, I'm just inverting it. And then I've also got the output of the converter feeding to an output which has actually been chosen to be one of the PWM outputs. I have a simple graphical slider control that lets me set the frequency of the output and the other input to this is actually setting the pulse width modulation between 0 and 100 um, because that's what these PWM outputs take. They take a value of 0 to 100% um, to set the duty cycle. So that then is one of the outputs and you can see here I put it through um, an inverter to show I can show the duty cycle and I have the frequency coming out as well and then the LED is actually hooked directly onto this OUT9 connection and that's what the analog one does. Uh, the, so the main program takes these two macros like subflows and simplifies them into just the block so you've got the whole sensor and you've got the analog and you can expose the output so that the the parent one the parent screen can use it and what I've got is three basic um, displays just showing the values that are coming in on the sensors. I have an alternate display sensor type here where it's just a um, like a filling bar graph and then I have the duty cycle and the frequency from that previous analog conversion logic that I just showed you being shown in seven segment display kind of outputs as well on this display. The Hall effect sensor, I've got the status of the actual Hall effect sensor, the first power LED, the delayed power LED, and then the third power LED that also takes the um, dark indication from the PWM. So if it's over 50% intensity, uh, which means it's dark and it's turned the LED strips on further, and then it will turn this on. And it looks like I just spelt dark with an L instead of a D, but anyway. Um, so it's delayed and dark, it's supposed to say, LED3. And base, you know, I'm going to zoom out in a second and show you all this connectivity, but as you can see here, if I just put my screwdriver near the whole sensor, right? aside from you can see probably in the background the lights changing, you'll see that the whole sensor is indicating that it is um, in operation and immediately the first LED indicator is turning on and actually out here I've got these 10 watt LEDs turning on as well. And if I put it there and hold it there for 10 seconds, so 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, It'll put it on, and because I've got the light intensity um, slightly over 50%, then the delayed one has also come on. Now, if I take the light sensor and point it up to the lights in the room, you can see that top one's gone down now because the duty cycle has gone down. And if I block it off again, then it comes back on again. So all of this is working the way it was intended. What you've got here is a graphical display, like a nice user interface, but it's not on a uh, HMI human machine interface as such it's plugged into the USB output of the micro uh, PLC and it's being shown on the um, in the designer the uh, micro micon design tool that you get now there's nothing wrong with that but obviously if you don't have the USB plugged in there's no other way of actually communicating with it I mean you potentially could put USB to um, Ethernet or something like that to remote it, but really this micro PLC is not really designed for that. This allows you to do a little graphical interface so that you can validate everything is working okay during design and things like that, or even uh, in operation, you could come along with a small tablet, which is what I've got here, plug it into the USB port, fire up the relevant application, and have a visual look to see whether everything is working. Now, the last element that I didn't mention before here is the um, trend. One of the things you can actually plug onto this is a graph so that you can actually show the analog inputs over time and things. And I've set it for a 10 minute interval. And you can see here if I point the light sensor up to the my lights in the office, the green track here has gone very high. And if I cover it up, it'll go down towards zero, which is what it's doing now. And it's slowly scrolling across. If I adjust the potentiometer, excuse my arm a second, so right now here it's showing um, 3.22 volts roughly. So if I bring this down, you can see it's going down. It's 1.5, 1, 
down to basically zero volts or I can go the other way and I can ramp it all the way up to 12 volts and then the temperature sensor that I have if I just hold it in my hand this is the top one it's reading 6.4 5 6.6 .6, so the voltage is going up because I'm heating the thermistor up um, but again it's not scaled to actual temperature you could probably do a little bit of rudimentary math on it to get it closer but again if this is some kind of industrial control um, you could basically have a table that just says, you know, a, a, with a broad set of temperatures and then roughly what the voltage would be um, with that divider, with that thermistor, and you can just set a comparator and, you know, turn a heater on and off or something like that. Right now, I'm just reading the analog voltage coming in from the thermistor um, just for demonstration purposes. And you can see here now that the um, analog values were going up and down as I was playing with those. Anyway, let me zoom out now, and uh, now I've shown you what the application is that I did. And this only took me an hour or two um, to set up. It was very intuitive. Um, had a couple of minor things just because I thought that I would be able to drop a digital uh, input onto the um, relevant pins of the PLC in the design tool, but I couldn't. I had to use a analog input because that's all it was. Um, available as far as the way it's defined but outside of that really it was uh, it was very easy to start configuring it I then spent a few minutes and um, rearranged the application by splitting it up into the analog inputs the whole sensor input and making those subflows so that this main screen here is not cluttered with all of the uh, interconnected logic if you want to see them even while it's operating you can just click on the uh, particular macro image and it'll go in and show you exactly what's happening on here. So you can see as my hand is covering the light sensor, you can see this top one here is going green as I'm changing the light input from here. So the comparator is hitting that threshold. And if I go to the analog input, which I think I've shown you before, uh, you, again, this is the frequency that I've got currently set, and you can change that by just dragging it. And if I go back to the main screen, it'll show you now that it's running at 6 kilohertz instead of the 11 that I had it before. So now let's just zoom out and show you the entire setup that I have here. So that's, uh, you've seen the PLC part of it. Sorry, this the graphical screen. But let's just look here for a moment. So I have the um, LED strip here. This is just a standard 12 volt LED strip. It's not a, it's not a full length one. It's only about a I don't know, just under a meter long or something, a couple of feet. Um, but it does draw a uh, 250 milliamps when it's turned on on one of the outputs. And then if I uh, show here, I've got three 10 watt LEDs. I've just bolted them to a piece of aluminum so because otherwise they get very hot very quickly. Um, I'm using a piece of breadboard at the back here just to do some of the interconnects. Uh, I've got a potentiometer here, which is the one I was twiddling with before. And here is the Bath uh, STG600 micro PLC um, hooked up with the cables going to the LEDs. Uh, the PLC, sorry, the um, pulse width modulation output, which is coming from output 9, which is a PWM output. It's the 2 amp grounded one. Um, I've got the 12 volts feeding into the light strip and then the uh, negative side of the light strip feeding into that input t uh, 10 on the PLC because that one is the one that actually takes the voltage to ground. The three power LEDs, they're being driven by the PLC uh, through the power LEDs, through some dropper current limiting resistors, and then back to the ground of the 12 volt supply. Now, what I've also got here is this is, uh, this Keysight um, 34470A multimeter is just simply measuring the um, quies sorry, the current being drawn from the DMM. Actually, it helps if I put it into uh, DC current. And it's currently sitting on the uh, 100 milliamp range, so it shows that we're drawing about 14 milliamps currently with the PLC. Um, I have not included the LED strip light in that range. That's being fed directly from the power supply um, to ground because obviously it's being, um, it's an external supply and I didn't want to drive too much um, power through the thin cabling because it doesn't have, you know, I need to put much heavier cables on this. Uh, otherwise, I'd get voltage drops and it would be misleading as far as what's happening. But now 
um, just to show you, if I turn on one of the LEDs now using the magnetic sensor, um, you see it drops up to half an amp. So that's one of them. If I keep it there, uh, this is being dr driven from the PLC out to the LEDs. So after 10 seconds, the second one will come on. So that's 1.3 amps now. And if I hide the light sensor and bring on the third one, you'll see that's up to... Sorry, one amp there. I must have had it already covered there. So 1.3 amps. Now down to one amp. And now down to half an amp. So based on the light level, so if I just hold that up, after 10 seconds, the second LED will come back on again. We're up to an amp, and now if I cover it, we're up to 1.3, 1.4 amps. But that basically shows you that that little bit of programming, you know, it's, it's achieving some industrial control functionality here. Now, the sensors I've got, I'm just going to zoom around to them so you can see, are um, standard industrial, they're all actual real industrial sensors. So what I have here is, this one is a, the light sensor. It's a Lux, it's actually inside, it's a um, light dependent resistor. So if I just zoom in on the actual display there, right, you can see it's one of those standard light dependent resistors you can get in um, little electronics kits that has uh, two legs on it and it just changes resistance quite dramatically depending on the light intensity hitting it. Uh, the second device I have here is a um, thermistor so it's a basically a 10k um, temperature dependent resistor so as you heat that up its resistance will change over time and then the third device I have is a uh, RS um, Hall effect proximity sensor and this is driven from anything from about 10 volts up to 24 or more volts so it's very suitable for industrial applications and I will be using these in my um, CNC machine that we're going to be building up on set over a separate set of tutorials over the coming months. Uh, but anyway, I'm using them right now just to hook up to this um, PLC just to be able to demonstrate what is happening with it. As you can see, there's the PLC right there all wired up. And the breadboard has just got that pot on the back of it just so that I can actually have a direct control uh, settable values. And that's pretty much it as far as the... Um, wiring that I've done for this quick demo. I just wanted to show very, very quickly how easy it is to use this thing and to um, get a program up and running. And of course, even though it's, you know, there's no, except for the power LED, or sorry, user definable LED on the front of the STG600, there is no real user interface unless you've got a computer plugged into it. Um, but as soon as you do plug a computer in, and if you had, you know, like a home automation system and you had a PC dedicated to running uh, a few things in the house, like your heating and ventilation, your lighting, uh, your burger alarm and a few other things, then you could quite easily have the USB hooked straight into the PC and you can be having a nice user interface like this. And you can actually, um, I don't have it on here, but you can actually have also buttons on here that also interact with the application. On the right hand side of this screen here, you'll see these are all the um, optional graphical tools that you can drag onto a screen. And one of the ones we've got here under control elements is, we, you've already seen the slider, and I use that to actually change the frequency of the output, and it does directly change the frequency. But the other one you've got here is a switch button, which you can also drag onto the screen. And um, you, you, know, you can define it as a switch or a button. Um, you can give it a value, 0, 1, so that's on or off. Um, you can change the size and the color and things like that of it. And you can just drop that on the screen, and then you can hook that up to an output. So if I actually um, put this, wire this to the output of this, no, it's not going to let me do that. I have to have an AND gate in here. Let me do, I'm not going to do a quick a full session here, but I'm just going to um, modify this so that I can use one input or another to drive um, two inputs, one output. Okay, so we've got an AND gate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this switch, feed it into the AND gate. I'm going to take the um, 
this and feed it onto the other input of the AND gate. And then I'm going to take the AND gate and connect it back to that output. So what I've done here is I've basically added a switch um, that will allow me to directly turn on and off one of the lights. So if I now run this and upload it to the controller, The controller will use the default value of the switch if there is no user interface connected through a PC like this. But once I've um, done this, now if I run this, oh, I'm already online. So now if I take my whole sensor and I put it in front of here, as you can see, you can see the big light just illuminating a bit of the background around the PC here. Uh, but you can see on the panel, the whole effect sensor is going right through and turning on that light right through through the OR gate. Now if I basically take that away and simply click the switch <laughs> that's clever. I've uh, hooked it up in the wrong place. One second. What I should have done is the output of the AND gate should have gone to the input of the um, output, not the ex not this. This is going to be changing the LED in the main program here on and off, but it won't have been um, changing the uh, output, which is actually this input, this this point right here. So we need to just disconnect that. Let's go offline, and we need to actually this output here is one HD. So now, if, and now I'm running. See, I can t hit the switch, and you can see the light coming on and off in the background. If I just zoom out a little bit, and if I just hit this switch now, all right, this is irrespective of the light sensor. Sorry, irrespective of the light sensor and irrespective of the magnetic sensor. All right now, if I go near the magnetic sensor, it will make no difference. If I turn this off because it's an OR on there. If I turn this off, now it will work with the magnetic sensor. Now, I haven't got this persisted in the programmer logic controller. There is a control that allows you to mem remember um, settings that deviate from the default. For instance, if I change the frequency into the PWM output, um, right now if I reboot the PLC, it will go back to the default setting. Uh, you can put in some storage that allows you to um, remember those settings so that if you go through a power cycle it will stay with the same setting. Anyway, that's a quick look at um, just a very simple program that you can set up. And as I said, the program is broken up into the main program, which is this one, which is basically just showing the uh, a graphical display with you know a little trend graph and things like that. And then I have two sub programs, one dealing with the whole sensor and um, feeding to power LEDs. And it's also taking an input from the light sensor, which is an analog input, and using that as part of the equation for the last part of logic to the third LED. Now, when you want um, a macro like this, when you want to bring outputs up to a different diagram, then you have to do these logical, uh, like they're virtual input-output pins, which show up um, on the device itself. You can, so if I go into design for the whole sensor, for instance, all of the inputs and outputs now I've dragged across. So I've created this object, which is what it's going to look like in another diagram. And I could change this to a, um, I'd like put a graphic on there or something if I wanted to. And then all of the inputs and outputs are now listed on the sites. And then when I go to a main diagram, I can, you know, like here, they've all been hooked up and they've got the names for them and everything else, which makes it really easy to create, like, a, a effectively a module that you can use and build up a suite of modules, so like a PID controller and various other things. Uh, and the analog is exactly the same in that we've got the analog module, we've got in, out, all these outputs designed, these two are float outputs, and these two, three are word um, type outputs, and then they also show up 
on the analog with the uh, different, you know, the names that we've given them to m them as well, and you can wire them into a bigger display. So nothing on this high-level display here is an actual real input and output. The analog module functions completely on its own within its own area here, where the, here's its output and here's its real inputs. Uh, and then the whole sensor does the same thing. Here's its input and here's its real outputs. Um, and then the very top level is just a pretty diagram so that an operator can look at it and get a high level view of whether things are working properly or not. But there is absolutely nothing to stop them. See, I've just put it back into run mode. I mean, the program here. So this is all nicely working. It's showing the status of things. You have to remember you've got to be online to see the um, sensors, act, the, everything actually interacting on here. So now I'm online, I can go in and all right, just affect things, um, you know, change the light levels, bring on the LED strip and stuff like that. But if I want to see what's happening on the analog, all right, I can go in here and here's my frequency control. So I can tweak the frequency for the PWM. Could be maybe I'm too generating too much noise at a higher frequency, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I can also click on these values, and it'll actually show me um, the actual value at that point. So it's like a debug screen as well, which is quite handy. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, very very handy. It's uh, very easy to learn how to program using the Micon software. Um, really, the limitations of what you can do with this is limited to your own imagination. You've got um, the 10 inputs and you've got your nine outputs. As I said before, um, two of the inputs can be high frequency inputs. The rest of them are lower frequency, up to 100 hertz. Um, the outputs are all 100 hertz frequency limited, uh, except for the PWM, which can go up to about five kilohertz. Um, I think, and the reality is, I think, even though this is what's written on the um, sheet of paper that came with the STG600, the reality is, as you can see here, I was upping this frequency uh, way beyond five kilohertz. So it can actually go way above that um, and still function. So I'm, uh, there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the uh, user guides and the, the quick specs as far as what its actual capabilities are. And I think it's actually a lot better than what it says on the quick specs. But as you can see, you get a really nice user interface built very quickly. Uh, it can drive LED loads and uh, other relays and various other things quite easily. Limiting factor on here right now is that the supply to the PLC and the outputs and the inputs are all connected to each other. So you've got a common ground and a common 24 volts or whatever the supply voltage between sort of 10 and you know 32 volts that you use for the programmable logic controller. They're all common. The outputs and the inputs are not opto-isolated in any way or isolated via any other means from the supply. So if you need your remote control, say you want to do mains or something, you will have to put intermediate circuitry in between it in order to um, provide that isolation. But if you're using this for automotive or um, for some kind of industrial app where it's all running on 24 volts and things and you don't need the isolation, then that will be perfect. You know, you can just hook it up and do what you need to do. The lack of the ability to drive a display and things like that, it might sound like a limitation initially, but as you can see, you've got the ability to do a graphical display for debug and testing. Once you've got that working, you can just unplug the computer and leave it to run autonomously and that would be just fine uh, and you could you know you you potentially could have a, an output from here going to some remote indicator or an alarm or something if you wanted to attract attention to a fault condition or something like that occurring yeah I guess the fact that you have to have the analog inputs over time as analog and you have to put in a hysteresis there to convert it to digital was uh, through me for a few minutes and you know it's and it's not ideal but it's not unsurmountable either you just have to remember that, that you've got to do that yeah so uh, I think that pretty much com covers it I will be using this programmable logic controller in future experiments as well so stay tuned for that um, by the time I'm done, I'm probably going to have four or five different kinds of programmable logic controller of uh, various capabilities, right from uh, the STG600, which is pretty rudimentary but very capable, right up to a full um, Arduino-based 
programmable, you know, uh, in properly built industrial controlled PLC where the programming is limited to whatever you can write and see and various other things because it's a programmable logic controller but they haven't restricted it by putting in one of the standard relay ladder uh, boolean kind of programming languages um, you still program it in the same way as you would any other uh, Arduino and things it's just got the interfacing and everything already built into the controller so that it can uh, drive your loads without any hassle. So you know, keep an eye out for that and it won't be too long in the future. Um, and I'm also going to be demonstrating how to use these things to drive things like stepper motors and stuff like that. Anyway, this is the initial review over. And um, as I say, I've been quite impressed considering the price point that this is aimed at and the market that it's aimed at. It is a very capable little programmable logic controller. Um, so when you get your next project and you want to have something that can drive up to 32 volt load, you know, that, so that could be a automotive application. It can be a lighting application, heating, um, you know, or some kind of museum, uh, effects system, you know, cause you can quite easily drive relays and various other things from this as well. Um, consider it definitely worth to considering for your applications and, um, it looks fairly robust. As I say, it's completely potted and everything else. So it's effectively, uh, I wouldn't you know, want to submerge it in water because obviously your analog inputs and things like that are going to be uh, affected by that. But it has certainly got a good set of uh, dust and humidity and you know, temperature ratings and things. As I say, it's full industrial control capable. So yeah, I like it.